Well, here we are, 2017. It's that time of the year again when we fit ourselves with a sense of optimism and make promises. We make promises to ourselves. We make promises to others. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're not going to do this. We're not do that as we launch into a new year. But then we find so many times that long before the year comes to an end, those commitments, those obligations, and those resolutions that we were so convinced we were going to keep and do fell through somewhere along the way. Let's be honest. How many of you all a year ago made a promise a commitment that you were going to start a diet and you kept it all year long. I see several nods in the negative, okay? How many of you had determined I'm going to exercise, I'm going to exercise regularly, routinely, I'm going to go walking, I'm going to go biking, I'm going to do what I need to do just to stay healthy and energetic and you really meant it when you said it. But then, crazy, hectic schedule, all kinds of demands, and guess what? Wasn't even March. And you realize that was short lived. See, those things happen. Well, this morning, I want us to talk about resolutions, and I'm not really going to call them resolutions, okay? I want them to be commitments. There's a difference between a resolution and a commitment, okay? We can resolve to do something, and then we can commit to do something. I want us to look at those commitments. And I believe that when we look at God's Word and look at those commitments and apply ourselves to those things, it can really make a radical difference in our life for the good if we'll follow through with them. I have called these the four thou shalt. Thou shalt do this. Thou shalt do this. And this is God speaking to us. This is what I think God is saying to us. This is what you need to do. Thou shalt do this and this and this and this. And we'll look at those four and see how that can change us and make us better for the good. I believe that by doing these, it can open up the gateway to a better life, to a better 2017 talked with a lady yesterday that gave me a, a phone call, and she was just really uh, thanking me for some things that I've done in her life and her family, and to my knowledge, she's only been here once or twice. She's not a part of our church. She's a part of another congregation, lives in another part of the county, but she said, you know, they experienced some tragedy this year. She said, I, I, I'm glad 2016 is almost gone. She says, well, I'll be honest with you. I am too. <laughs> you know, 2016, well, not, not whatever, whatever it means. 2016 was not one of my better years from ministry in a lot of ways. You don't even know the half of it. <laughs> you really don't. Just personal things and things that I've had to deal with. And there's a part of me that says, you know, I, I, I'm glad to get rid of 2016. But you know what? I don't know if 2017 is going to be any better. I really don't. It's just a matter of living every day, looking to God for His strength, for His wisdom, for His leadership, for His guidance. Helping me, Lord, to do the things that I don't have to come to the end of the day or the end of my life and see a lot of regrets. And I think when we focus in on these things that we're talking about today, we'll be better for it. The first thou shalt is... Thou shalt forget your failures. Have you ever failed in anything? Have you ever tried something and you just flopped? Uh, you're not raising your hands, but I can raise mine, okay? I've done that many times. And if we're all honest with ourselves, we'll know that's happened to us all. We notice the Apostle Paul writing something. Probably I'm giving, take a few years, let's say 2,000 years ago. In the third chapter of the book of Philippians, 
he gave us some advice. Forget what is behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for which God has called me. I like the King James Version on this particular passage. Pressing on toward the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Pressing on toward the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. I think that's some pretty good advice, to be honest with you. I look at this. These are words of advice that the Apostle Paul is giving as God is leading him to tell this to the church of Philippi. And that one passage there has really stood the test of time. It is very relevant. It is very practical in its advice. See, I'm convinced that when God is living in our lives, when his presence is obvious in our lives, when he's living in our hearts, that we don't have to live our lives imprisoned by the past. Now, what God's word is saying is that we must not allow ourselves to be bogged down by our past failures. And if we're not careful, well, the devil gets a hold of that, and he'll try dragging us down and giving us flashbacks of all those things that we did wrong and all those failures that, that we had and say, your life is worth nothing, and you begin to feel bad about yourself. It's poor, poor, pitiful me. And that's not what God wants us to do. It's now not how God wants us to feel. Don't dwell on the past to the point that it stops you, it keeps you from moving forward, pressing toward the mark of the high calling, which is in Christ Jesus. Folks, I don't know a better way to start off a brand new year than to rise to the challenge that we have right here in this passage. We need to be able to say, okay, Lord, I am going to, and you fill in the blank. This year, with your help, with your strength, with your presence. How would you fill in your blank? What I would fill in my blank may be different than what we would fill in in your blank. But it's something we need to look at, every one of us. Okay, Lord, this year, I am going to fill in that blank right now in your own mind. What would it be? It could be many things. This is what I'm going to do. I cannot do it in my own strength. But with your help, your strength, your presence, I'm convinced, Lord, I can do it. So stop torturing yourself. We like to do that, don't we? Satan likes for us to do that. Torture ourselves about what we did do or maybe the things we did not do. And we can't go back and erase those things that have been done. They're sort of like a scrambled egg. You know, once it's scrambled... You can't bring it back to its original form. It's that way. We've got to move forward. Yes, I believe that 2017 can be a great year to determine that we are going to stop being changed, chained to our failures. It's like a ball and chain. We, we go around and we do the things that we're supposed to be doing, but we're carrying a ball and chain. And it drags us down. We can't be doing what we want to do. We can't be actively involved in ministry and doing what God wants us to do when we're trying to pull this weight that we need to let go of. We can't be effective. God is saying, don't brand your life with your failures. You see, I'm reminded that God's Word tells us that Jesus Christ on the cross forgave us for our sins. And when we accept his forgiveness for our sins, then, then we can begin to forgive ourselves. So many times, so many times in my life and in my ministry, I've heard people say, I just can't forgive myself. But Christ forgives us. And when I look at the weight of sin that I've carried along and see where Christ was able to forgive me of that, then why can't I forgive myself? We're shortchanging God when we say that God can forgive us, but we can't forgive ourselves. Wherever you might be in your own spiritual journey, 
You might be today at a point where you've never accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And if that be the case, then you need to know, you'll never know what forgiveness is and be able to forgive others and and forgive yourself. Be able to accept that forgiveness that God offers us until we know Him and accept His love. The second, thou shalt. Thou shalt give up your grudges. You had any grudges? Oh, we've had grudges for years. I don't remember the first grudge I ever tried to carry. Probably way back there on the dairy farm somewhere. I probably had a grudge against Betty, number three, that cow that kicked me. And I still got a scar on my hand. I didn't like that cow. She didn't like me by the time uh, it was all over. But I'm talking about much more serious grudges than that. I'm talking about grudges with our fellow man. Listen to the words from the Apostle Paul as he is speaking to the church of the people of Colossae. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievance you may have with one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Did you catch that phrase? Forgive as the Lord forgave you. That's God speaking in his own word, and in doing so, he's challenging us. He's challenging us directly. He's challenging us personally to give up our grudges. Now, that means forgiving others of what those grievances may have been toward us. Now, you won't find this in Webster Dictionary, okay? This is my definition for a grudge. An unforgiving spirit that leads to an unforgiving attitude, and there's that domino effect, then that leads to unforgiving actions. None of that is pleasing before God. God can't use those things. Now, you need to know if you haven't really thought about this. Grudges are very dangerous. As a Christian, as a child of God, grudges are very dangerous. Because they are destructive. They are destructive in nature. They are destructive in so many ways. It's grudges that destroys marriages. It's grudges that breaks up friendships. It's grudges that cause all kinds of problems and all kinds of relationships. Grudges. So if I read God's Word correctly... And if I find myself under the leadership of the Holy Spirit as I read God's Word, it tells me, let go of those grudges. You may have a grudge with somebody in your own home, in your own household. You might very easily have a grudge with people you work with. I know plenty of people that do that. You might even have a grudge with somebody sitting in the same pew that you are right now. God is saying, give it up. Let go of it. Give it up. Now, grudges are not only destructive. I'm convinced they are self-destructive. I really believe that grudges can do more harm to you, to me, than it does to others. You know, I've lived long enough, and I deal with a lot of people. In a year's time, I wish I could calculate the number of people. It may be just a handshake. It may be a minute conversation with somebody. I may never see them again. But if you count all those people, well, there's a lot of connections that I've made over the years. Some of those people have grudges against somebody else. I might have a grudge against somebody else. God is saying, let go of that. See, people try to get even. I think about a situation I had to deal with uh, in town several months ago. Bottom line is, this guy had a grudge with this guy, and this guy was determined to get even with this guy. Who benefits from that? Really, as a Christian, who benefits from that? Unforgiving people wind up being 
in prison. Prison of their own anger. Prison of their own resentment. Prison of their own guilt. They find themselves in the prison of their own depression. Things that they brought about. And God is saying, don't sentence yourself to prison. Set yourself free. Give up. Give up those grudges. Get rid of them. Looking at God's word, I ask the question, how do you give up a grudge? How do you do that? If you had time, I might even just say, write it down on your own bulletin. How do you think God's word tells us to forgive or, or to let go of grudges? You forgive. You forgive. As Christ has forgiven us. I'll think about the parable of the servants, and I don't have the time to get into that today, but reading that this past week, I got to thinking about some things. God is not asking us to ignore the wrong that may have been done to us, to someone else. God is not asking us to pretend that it really didn't happen. God's not even asking us to pretend that it doesn't matter. But God is telling us to let go. Let go. Wash your hands of that. Move forward in the strength of the Lord for his cause. God asks us. God commands us to let go of those grievances. Go ahead and acknowledge. Go ahead. Don't cover it up. Hide it under the rug. Don't act like it didn't hurt you. Don't act like it doesn't bother you. Though being human, that's going to happen. But move forward. And you can only move forward when you let go of that grudge. Get it out of the way. It's like a great big backpack that you find yourself carrying around or a ball and chain. Let go of it. Any deep-rooted resentment that any of us have against someone, I hear God saying, let it go. Let it go. Now, I also hear God saying this. <laughs> Don't tell me you can't forgive. This is God speaking, okay? Don't tell me you can't forgive. I hear this all the time. I cannot forgive. Don't tell. God is saying, don't tell me you can't forgive. What you're really saying is you won't forgive. See, when our heart's right, we'll do the right thing. But when our heart is not right, when our heart is living in the flesh and living in the world, that happens when we get out of this book here, then we find ourselves doing just exactly what we're not supposed to be doing. The third thou shalt. Thou shalt restore your relationships. Restore your relationships. You know, every time I turn off a computer, and I don't turn my computer off every night, but when I do turn it on, I off, and then I turn it back on the next day, it, it comes up something asking me if I want to run a check on the programs. Hmm, had that happen the other day. You know, I think God could say something very similar to us. Do I need to run a check on your programs? Do I need to run a check and remind you of what's in here? That maybe needs to be cleared out. You know, yes, Lord, there's some programs there that I'm not programmed quite in accordance to your will. Help me, Lord, to get that straightened out. Run a check. Clear it all out. Romans 12, 18 says, if it is possible, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live in peace with one another. That's an important phrase there. As far as it depends upon you. See, that's the challenge that God issues to us. If we're going to restore 
any of those relationships. And you know, there's some people out there just, I want to do the right thing. You may want to do the right thing, but there's always others out there that don't want because they're blaming you. And you may be wrong. I may be wrong. But I go back to the words that I heard Billy Graham say just a few weeks ago. Actually, it was in the archives. I think he was preaching in Orlando, Florida, somewhere around 1976 or something. But boy, when I heard him say that, I have put that in my brain and I, I keep saying it. Billy Graham said, I may be able to change your mind, but I can't change your heart. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can do that. Only the presence and the power of God can change our hearts. Every morning when I get up, I'm asking God to run a check on my programs. Make sure all those things are right, Lord. Make sure that they're in gear. Because if there's that dirt and filth inside my program here, and it doesn't have to be here, it can also be here, then clear that out. Get it corrected. I'll have problems with my computer if it's not. I'll have problems with my physical computer if it's not cleared out. I can't help but wonder how many marriages out there that are not where they could be or should be right now. I can't help but wonder about all of those partner relationships that people have. People that are in business together, they can't stand each other. I can't help but wonder what it would be like with family members if they could just get to the point where they could say, I was wrong. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. Where, where will we be? Where will we be as a, as a nation, as a country? If we could just come, I was wrong. I've never had problem admitting I was wrong, I don't think. I need to say that sometime. I was wrong. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I can go a long way in restoring relationships. And then the last one here is thou shall turn your back on your transgressions. Turn your back from your sin. Turn your back on that violation of the law of God. Things that are wrong. Walk away from that. Instead of, well, I know that's wrong, but I keep on doing it. We've got to determine in our minds, we're going to walk away from that. It's over here. I'm leaving it. Reminded of a story of something I read recently about the American Civil War. And I may have shared this somewhere out. Sometimes I go through all this stuff and do this research and I read it. Sometimes I plan on using it in a sermon and I don't. And sometimes I don't think I did and I did. So you may have heard this. I don't know. But it's worth telling again. The Civil War was over. And slaves were being freed. But many of those slaves decided that they were going to stay with their former master. They had the opportunity of being free. You're on your own. Go. You're free. But they stayed back. Well, I can understand that. There was a sense of security, I imagine, with some of those slave owners because they were good to them. But the point that I want to make about that is Jesus Christ died to set us free. Set us free from our sin. Okay, there's your sin. Let go of it. But we're just like those slaves going back to their master. We can't let go of it. And we don't let go of it. It hurts us. It robs us of everything that God wants us to be. See, as I read through the New Testament, it tells me that Christ died to set me, set you free. We can have the power to be free. But so many times we go right back to that old master that has enslaved us and drug us down and kept us from being 
everything that God wants us to be. Romans 6, 2 says, Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to your lustful desires. We are no longer slaves to sin. If we know Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, then we are not to be enslaved to that. I'm winding things down now. Story is told of a man and his wife together in a particular setting, and the man had a huge growth on his neck. Somebody asked the wife about it. She said, oh, I've tried to get him to check into that and have that taken care of. And he's had it for years. And he's not going to do anything. He has just learned to live with it. He has just learned to live with it. When I hear that, I can't help about thinking uh, about our own spiritual life and how crippled our spiritual life can be because we have just learned to live with the besetting sin in our lives. We just learned to live with it. It's been so much a part of our lives because we've been enslaved to it, because we did not walk away from it. And sort of gotten used to it. Just learn to live with it. Maybe you've got a quick temper that you've never been able to control. Maybe you have a caustic tongue that has assassinated somebody's character and reputation. See that all the time. Just look at Facebook and you can see that. Have you learned to live with a critical, judgmental attitude? And you sort of got used to it. See, I'm afraid that far too many of us, if not every one of us from time to time, have something that's a growth that's on us. We know it's wrong. It doesn't please God. It doesn't glorify Him. But we've gotten used to it. We've learned to live with it. God says, turn your back on that sin. Turn your back on the things that are wrong, whatever it is. Stop letting it control you. God is telling us. Give it up. Let go. Get rid of that old master. Don't be going back to it. Get rid of it. See, we don't have to go into a new year being defeated by sin. Let's not do that. Let's not launch into a brand new year defeated by the things that Satan wants us to be defeated by. See, I believe that when we go through these, thou shalt. Your life, my life, our life, We'll all be better for it. Deep down in my heart, I really want to do what's right and what's pleasing to God. I'm convinced you do too. It all goes back to something I've been preaching for all my years in the ministry. You probably get tired of me saying it. But we need to hear it. When I get away from this book, I don't mean just reading it. You can read it all day long. If you're not living it out, then reading it obviously didn't help me too much. But taking that word and applying it to my heart, when I do those things, God blesses me. God will bless you. God will bless our church as you strive to do those things. Let's pray. My blessing for each of you is this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Are you ready for Christmas? How many times have you been asked that question this season? Or how many times have you asked that question to someone else? It was just yesterday, right before our candlelight service. Someone standing out of